Uh, we're really excited to be here with you uh, this morning, and uh, thank you for joining us. I would just like to pause for a minute and congratulate Dan and his team on putting this great event together. So let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you for coordinating this. Um, very excited to see how this will grow in the future. So thank you for having us, and it's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I am from Texas, so uh, it is a little bit cooler um, here uh, than it is in Texas today, so not, not by much, actually. Uh, but we're really excited to be here today and to talk about something that, you know, our industry uh, has been challenged with in the past, is challenged with today, and will be challenged with in the future uh, relating to uh, data center energy use and how that impacts market growth. And, uh, and so we're excited to get to share with you the thoughts that this team has uh, on stage. And uh, it's a great group. And I was just walking through, um, and I'm actually going to introduce each individual here, but uh, there's a lot of industry expertise on this stage. So gentlemen, thank you for joining today. Very excited that you're here. Um, and we're going to talk about how our industry will be impacted by uh, you know, clean energy uh, usage moving forward and some of the challenges that are there. So uh, I'm going to introduce each panelist, and then we'll jump in. Uh, to my left, this is Max Givon. Max is Vice President and General Manager with uh, Vantage Data Centers here in Canada. Uh, he oversees all operation efforts, and previous to that, uh, he was leading the efforts with Four Degrees and uh, has been in the industry a long time. Max, thank you for being here. Um, to his left is David Cervantes. David is a Senior Vice President with CBRE's Data Center Solutions Group. Uh, so he sits actually with end users that are making infrastructure decisions and really helps guide them through that IT infrastructure decision making process, which if you've uh, walked that path, you know how challenging it can be. So having uh, guidance from uh, individuals like David is very helpful. So David, thanks for joining us. David's been in the industry for over 15 years and focused here in Canada. Uh, David Holub is to his left. And uh, he focuses on leading the uh, sales and leasing efforts for Cloud HQ. So if you've driven down Loudoun County Parkway in Northern Virginia, in Ashburn, you will see what Cloud HQ is doing. And it's, uh, it's, it's impressive, uh, not just there in Northern Virginia, but internationally as well. So David, thank you for being here this morning. Um, to his left is Tom Traugott. Tom is with EdgeCore, and he is vice president of their uh, uh, revenue and client growth. And uh, he is focused on growing their portfolio through uh, customer acquisition. Uh, previous to his time at EdgeCore, he was with Amazon Web Services and uh, led their efforts in growing their platform, not just here in the U.S., but also in Europe and um, Asia as well. So, Tom, thanks for being here. Uh, Phil Lawson Shanks is the Chief Development Officer for Aligned Energy. And uh, prior to his time at Aligned, he was the Chief Innovation Officer with EdgeConnex. And during that time period, EdgeConnex Edge Connects had um, a, considerable, a considerable amount of growth. And so uh, excited to uh, get your expertise. Been in the industry for over 25 years. So, Phil, thanks for being here. And sitting on the very end, waiting for his name to be called, is Senior Vice President and Partner with Stream Data Center's Anthony Bolner. Um, Anthony is a fellow Texan and uh, has been with Stream for about 15 years. Has been in the data center industry for over 25 and owns probably the best burger restaurant in Dallas. Anthony does. So if you're ever in Dallas, you come with me. We'll go get burgers for free, Anthony told me. So there you go. Um, anyway, thank you for being here. Let's give our panelists a hand just for being here. And thank you, gentlemen. This is great. I already have them clapping for you, and you haven't even said anything. This is awesome. So yes. Um, so one of the things I'd like to just start with is you know, the fact that we've really seen some uh, incredible things happen in Montreal from a data center perspective in the last, you know, 24 to 36 months. And, uh, and so, Max, let's start with you. Why do you think uh, users today are finding this area to be so attractive from a data center growth perspective? That's a good question. I'll say <clears throat> mainly four reasons why uh, Montreal is a hot market right now. And uh, Mr. Martel from Hydro uh, Quebec mentioned two of them already. The first one is the cost of power. Everybody knows that data centers, operators consume a lot of power. So being able to get access to very competitive rate, one of the cheapest uh, rate in North America, as uh, Mr. Martel mentioned earlier, uh, makes a difference in our cost operations. The second one, 99.5% of Hydro-Quebec's energy, it's green. 
So you can see uh, on September 27 in Montreal, there's 500,000 people down here uh, telling to the government, hey, wake up, you need to do something related to our planet. The planet's dying, so green energy, it's one of the uh, major hyperscaler requirements. We see that more and more. The third one is uh, the climate. As you can see today, it's quite cold. <laughs> so uh, cooling down our data module, uh, it's a lot easier for us using specialized equipment like free cooling system that allows us not to consume power to cool down our room. That makes a difference at the end. And the last one, in my mind, it's the network. There's a multiple of fiber path, fully diverse from the East Coast, big nap like Ashburn or New York, coming down directly to, uh, to Montreal. And uh, with low latency, that makes a difference. So if you add on top of that the good economical environment, a lot of enterprise, good labor, it makes a difference yeah. to be a hot market right yeah. now. And David, what, what would you add to that from you know, Max is seeing that from a data center operator side, <laughs> Vantage data centers. David, sitting with data center users, how are you seeing them look at the market and what would you add to that? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll go in reverse order and just, just grab that last point about, about network, proximity to eyeballs. People need to be here. This is, this is a declared and growing secondary tier two market and people need to have presence in those places. And when we have end users identify that they wanna have a presence in Montreal, they're pinging all of their partners and colleagues all in, in all the other markets and our phones start blowing off the hook. So there's a bit of a bit of an echo chamber. As soon as an end user says, I gotta service my customers uh, in Eastern Canada, you pretty much have a Toronto versus Montreal proposition and they gotta quickly get up to speed on what's going on in both markets. So from an end user perspective, it's really uh, chasing the eyeballs, chasing the customer base, and that's, the, that's really the first step to people triggering on this market. Yeah, so um, Phil and David Holub, when you all have interacted with users that have that um, desire for renewable energy, sustainable solutions, you, you know, that is in your mind to deliver that product, but you also have a business to run and that, that's, there's cost behind that. So talk about some of the challenges as a, as a data center operator with the solutions that you offer and how to do that best. Sure, so I think, I'm on. Yeah, I think it starts with the design elements as well. So obviously energy is, is paramount, getting uh, low cost energy. A lot of our customers demand that. It used to be that uh, the environmental decision making was a nice to have, now it's mandatory for particularly for the hyperscalers and for a lot of the more sophisticated enterprise consumers and buyers. But it, it it, it's all about the design, it's uh, how you create that platform. A lot of the data centers that uh, we see today are still designed as they were 50, 60 years ago. They were designed for people to live in them alongside the teletype machines and the, um, you know, the, the big AS, well, the model 39s or whatever, IBMs. We don't need that anymore. If you think about, if you've seen any images of how uh, the Googles and Amazons build their data centers. It's a data factory. It's a, it's a slab floor, no ceiling plenums. They really run the systems as hot as they possibly can. Uh, the, you know, we used to have ASHRAE, ASHRAE standards are important, but that's for when people are living in those places. Now you can drive capacities much, much higher than you ever could before. You know, 50 plus kilowatts of cabinet. So once you take all of those elements into place and you look at the cooling, and particularly here where you can, you can leverage the, or leverage, now I'm in Canada, I can say leverage, um, leverage the, the more extensive cooling technologies. That coupled with power, how you build them, how you operate them, that's really what customers are looking for. They're looking to maximize they, they know exactly how many uh, cents or pennies every watt costs them to run their business. And they, they want that whole supply chain to, to follow their, their economics. Uh, well, thank you for having me and, uh, and inviting Cloud HQ. And uh, I have to admit, I'm, I'm new to the Canada market in general in many respects, and specifically Montreal. I do have. Uh, some exposure uh, working with renewables in the U.S. and Cloud HQ actually has a, a wind farm business to support uh, data centers in the U.S. as well. I, I would use uh, Phil's segue into the cost aspect of it. You know, Cloud HQ is a you know we're a we're a real estate developer. We we develop very large hyperscale data centers. That's our focus. Um, we're looking for markets to enter uh, that our customers are anticipating going into. And we're trying to you know, develop properties that uh, you know, in a very expeditious way and cost-effective way 
so that we're literally competing with Amazon's internal model or Google's internal model for developing data centers. So when I look at what I'm learning about Montreal, obviously the cost of power is very attractive. Uh, and from what I'm learning too, uh, the financial structures for renewables are much more uh, sort of friendly, if you will. Uh, we don't, in the US we have a lot of distortions that we have to deal with from tax incentives and so forth and tax equity and what subordination you can get in debt and so forth. And I think what I'm hearing in Canada is those things don't exist here. Uh, but what we do need is the demand, frankly. I, I need those big hyperscalers to say that's a market we want to be in or at least hear it in the meetings and we'll run there and do it, you know, as fast as we can for them. But, you know, our model, just to be clear about how we develop, is to really drive down operational costs. So we build very large sites. You know, I think of it the way our chairman describes it is, you know, essentially we want that really big denominator in your operational costs. So if I build, you know, a 70 or 90 megawatt data center, I'm dividing all that operational cost by a very large denominator. So, you know, are we open to markets like this? Yes. Is it interesting? Yes, we're looking for that demand or those signals of demand to start to move into them. Sure, and, and Tom, maybe you can comment on this and, and also, Max, I'd love your thoughts. When a large user finds a market attractive, what does that do and, and actually takes a large position there? What does that do for the overall um, view of that market? So I think, I think we've certainly seen some of that here in, in Montreal over the last 12 to 24 months and how does that change the way that end users and other large providers might look at locating in that location? Well, um, thanks for uh, having me participate. Um, you know, m our business, EdgeCore, is very similar to, uh, to Dave and CloudHQs, and, you know, we're primarily in the United States right now in sort of large primary and secondary markets with large scale-out campuses, 30, 50 acres. And we're, um, our positioning there is to meet similar scale-out demand. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, my sort of past experience that jumped out with Montreal, um, and I think Dave Cervantes touched upon this, Montreal for, you know, its own localized endemic demand is sort of, a, it's a um, second tier, secondary market compared with some of your larger population centers. Um, but what is intriguing is its proximity, and look at Northern Virginia, right? So if, uh, I grew up in the New York metro area, and back when, 20 years ago, the, the locus of data center, the largest data center market was New York, uh, New, York New Jersey. Um, that has radically shifted on the East Coast, and I have, you know, if I were to compare, uh, not to, Maybe I'm looking for some cheap cheers here, but you know, uh, Toronto to Montreal, the evolution of the dynamic between Northern New Jersey financial services, very enterprise centric, to Northern Virginia, which had more, you know, network density proximity, you know, still relatively low latency for most applications, um, and s scale out potential, you know, that, you know, to me that resonates for Montreal having you know, a solid um, local base of demand, but the potential to compete on a global scale, right? So low cost power, um, you know, low cost lands, you know, relative speed in terms of permits entitlements. Um, there's some areas where, you know, the, the market could probably mature some of the, you know, perspective in terms of what, what generators contribute, right? I mean, emergency generators are not, you know, power plants. And that's that. That's been an issue, but um, I think the the fundamental um, perspective that any of the you know large you know hyperscale users are taking is what uh, I can start in this market. What does it look like at you know 10, 20, 30 x? Right. Certain markets take a footprint. You'll deal with that localized demand, but you won't really scale out. I think that's one of the, the opportunities and one, one of the reasons why kind of new firm um, back to looking at Montreal is that it does have scale out potential. Um, but until you see more um, large anchoring sort of users um, that make it more of a global destination, um, 
you're not quite at that tipping point in terms of scaling. But yeah, that's I was, so. I was going to ask for um, the uh, David Cervantes and, and Max your your perspective on just how quickly do you think this market can grow because of some of the things that the energy uh, the the good energy story that's there, the, the low cost of power. Um, are the are there, there there's a lot of comparison to some other very large markets and so is there maybe like are there unrealistic expectations regarding that I mean are, are we thinking way too big or are we thinking too small what are y'all's thoughts on that I can go um, the demand is there the demand is there we see it we we have a quite large funnel that we're working on right now so it, it's not a dream it's, it's there so there's some needs that's gonna be a hot market like Ashburn with 1,000 megawatt active? I don't think so. It might be smaller than that, but let's say we're gonna get 25% of that, 250 megawatts. Our provider, Hydro-Quebec, might be very happy with that <laughs> type of power. So, and one of, uh, a part of your question was, what is the impact of these big players coming down? You asked that a bit earlier. It increased the ecosystem. This is what's happening. So when big guys coming down in Montreal and putting all in their infrastructures, uh, it, it increases uh, the ecosystem. Everything's related to that. Everything's turning turning around that. And uh, you can have example like Facebook putting their lab in Montreal, or the AI uh, market or ecosystem, which is very very uh, deep here in Montreal. I do have some friends in the AI business, and everything turns around AI these days. You can add on top of that the VFX market or gamings. So that drives the demand in Montreal, in my mind. Well, just one of the interesting things we can pick up from what Phil said, um, and maybe news to anyone who's uh, not familiar with the Montreal market, is we really didn't have a large retail data center market at all. So Toronto was the center of enterprise demand, and Toronto was the center of the retail market, you know, seven plus years ago. And so subsequently, uh, the Toronto market is full of legacy facilities. And Montreal's market really exploded uh, with the advent of wholesale and hyperscale. So a lot of our relevant inventory is new. A lot of our specification of data centers is, you know, a, a lot of the same specs that the, that the cloud users would, would prescribe. And so what that does is it, it basically puts us into a, a jump start to really be prepared for that scaling it's, it's always great for us to uh, hear about our providers being pinged by end user demand. And when you compare you know, the Montreal and Toronto markets, which presumably many of those end users are considering in tandem, um, Montreal's in this, again in this, in this great position to take advantage of, 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 of where we are. And just to bring it back to the green story uh, a, a little bit, um, on a side-by-side -side basis, you know, it's just another line item of, if I don't, if, if I can say s superior opportunity to work in a market that costs you less to operate in, in terms of power, which costs you uh, less to acquire land and build in, which allows you to be closer to Metro than any position you could likely take up in Toronto. And then you have this green story, which is hopefully becoming a, a tick box on the, on the site selection. Not the first thing, but definitely a very strong line item in how these groups are making decisions. So the question is, can we outperform our other markets? Can we pull traction and deals from those markets into Montreal? I'd say that we're in position to do so as long as that demand holds up. So uh, I'm with Stream Data Centers, and we are a developer and operator of wholesale co-location space in several uh, U.S. markets. And we came up here to Montreal a year and a half ago to assist a good client, GI Partners, with a, a very large second generation asset that they bought here in this market that was built in 2016. And it has really opened my eyes to the Montreal market and, and specifically Hydro-Quebec and the, the offering that, that they have of, of green energy and low cost energy and the stability in that pricing. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think we all stress that story enough but I think the comment that was made down here about Montreal being a key 
wholesale market, a key hyperscale market. That's the type of demand that we're seeing here in the Montreal market. I, I don't disagree 100% that um, Toronto has been, call it the, you know, retail co-location, uh, the, the, you know, certainly the largest market uh, in Canada for, uh, you know, historically and for retail. But I, I think it's really important the number of hyperscale users that are that are looking here in the Montreal market currently and really just over the last 18 to 24 months. So I think it is it is a uh, it, Montreal market is in a growth mode, no question. So uh, it, yeah, it, it is following what we have seen in, you know, you, you almost can't compare it to Northern Virginia, but I like comparing it to Phoenix or, sure. you know, even yeah. Chicago and Dallas, where we're really starting to see significant hyperscale and cloud growth in, in those U.S. markets. That was a good recap, and if I may add, we, we have all the piece of the puzzle to bring the big hyperscale in Montreal, as we talked about for the last few minutes. But our challenge is going to keep them happy. And to keep them happy, it's to show them scalability. These guys consume a lot of power, and they want power right now. So you need to make sure to build inventory, and building inventory, it's all related to cash. So we need to invest a lot, take some risk to make sure we stay attractive. Yeah, effective to them. I think it's interesting, you know, if you look at the way data center markets have grown over the past five years, one of the uh, one of the consistent characteristics that we've seen across markets that are trying to attract this type of demand is that that planned power that we track has increased over the past two years, which is which is data center operators realizing, listening, hearing from the user that bigger demand is coming and starting to position themselves to to receive that demand when it when it's here. You know, yesterday uh, we had the opportunity to, to uh, visit uh, uh, CoLogix, uh, the GI partner site, uh, and eStructure's data center. And it was really interesting to hear the messaging coming from them, which was, hey, there's, there's enterprise demand out there and we certainly can handle that, but these are solutions designed to handle bigger demand. And I think as that uh, market message hits those users, uh, that will certainly have an impact. Phil, from your perspective, when you, t if we if we think about hyperscale growth, and then we think about the enterprise group that's still out there, and David, I'd love your thoughts too. Um, how do you, how do they think about green energy? How do they think about renewables? Because, you know, some companies that are very large, that's certainly a, you know, corp they they realize they're corporate citizens, and we have to make really good decisions. As you get smaller, that is, is that something that you're seeing maybe grow in importance from, th from their perspective? Oh, absolutely. We have um, several um, large-scale enterprises, web-scale, we would call them. Um, they, they operate as a, as a hyperscaler, but they're really an enterprise. Uh, Rideshare companies, airlines, fintech. Um, it used, as I say, it used to be um, there were separate groups, the, the, the power uh, uh, acquisition group and then the... Uh, uh, the more environmentally friendly group, but now they're they're still coming together. There's a lot of tension between them still, um, as to buying the you know, having consistent power pricing, whether it's uh, PPA or uh, VPPA, all the different programs that the power providers can provide. That coupled with the message that the corporate group want to give out about their their green stance, and then we saw the other week with Google, there was a, almost a walkout of of the employees where they felt that the messaging wasn't really being followed through in the whole company. Um, and that's going to be more and more prevalent, I think, through the enterprises. Um, we see a lot of customers where before it was just a nice to have, but now it's mandatory in their, their RFPs that there's green energy. In, in Phoenix, where we, we can procure um, solar power for the majority of the time and solar after sunset with the batteries and, and uh, hydro, um, it's just become so, so important. And, uh, with our microgrid technologies that we have there, so we can feed back and, and enable the, the utilities to uh, uh, power shave their, their own yields. It, it makes a big difference to a lot of our, our enterprise customers to be able to give them that flexibility. Well, I guess I'm thinking about a little bit more like the new Quincy, but without the sort of limitations on supply and with people. <laughs> um, what, uh, what occurs to me, however, though, is you know, what we've dealt with with customers 
and we're dealing with it in multiple markets now in Europe as well as the US, is when they have renewable requirements or renewable preference, uh, they'll put a lot of the onus on us to help source the power and manage it. And it gets quite complex, the whole, you know, are we, or in the case, for example, we have this project in Texas uh, where we have, uh, we're providing power, it's not one of ours, but we're providing uh, power to a 40 megawatt data center. And we've got 100 megawatts of renewable wind energy. Uh, but th there you see the ratio, right? We have to generate, 100, we have 100 watts of generation to provide 78% of the load to a 40 megawatt data center. What's interesting about, what strikes me about Montreal is there's sort of none of those complications. I don't have to worry about the distribution hub, the ISO, the, you know, any of the sort of myriad, I could just go on and on, complications it takes to manage and, uh, renewables in the context of the customer's interest in them, right? Because it's just all green energy here. There's no complication around it, if you will. Uh, and can I build on that? I think the, the simply put, what you're describing, Dave, is the sort of pinwheels that um, folks go through to, uh, you know, basically hide baseload. So, I mean, every renewable offset strategy, you know, with solar and wind, because it's not always sunny and it's not always windy, and energy storage is not at sort of 30-day, you know, sort of uh, lifespans, right, where you can truly run off whatever you generate from the renewables, um, you ha there is a complementary baseload. So they're in, you know, supporting every data center around the world, you know, except for certain locations, you have complementary fossil fuel fired base load to run when the sun's not shining and when the wind's not blowing. So a distinction that, you know, I, I think Hydro-Quebec could, you know, certainly push more is the renewable aspect is also complemented by base load, right? Which simplifies the math. Um, the, there is a lot of uh, um, very complicated, you know, you're, you're describing the complexity of schemes to effectively hide the fact that, well, you know, yes, it's, there's offsetting renewable plant, but the, until energy storage um, becomes more meaningful, most of, uh, you know, or considerable amount of the um, energy used by the data centers is going to be fossil fueled in mo most parts of the world. Yeah, so when you think about Montreal as a, as a growth area, uh, you know, if we came back here in two years, I know a lot of the individuals in this room today are, you know, heavily tied to this area. Um, you know, what are things that the area can do to differentiate themselves Maybe it might be better communication, maybe it might be more options, but what are things that the area can do to ensure that if we came back two years from now, three years from now, we would see that you know, 10, 25% growth that, we, that Max brought up? What, what do you all think that the, the area can do to, to attract that demand? One thing I'm gonna give you a, a, a heads up that I think we're getting, we're getting uh, pushed for time awesome. here, which is- This will be the last question, thank last you. Last question. But uh, I do think that the key markets in North America, at least from my perspective that we've seen, um, can be categorized as high supply, high demand markets. So I don't think more supply is a bad thing. And I would just say that things that can be put in place, incentives, uh, you know, ease of, ease of doing business, things like that, that can add to the supply, don't make it a don't don't be uh, fooled by that being a bad market. I, I think supply in our business, because timing is so important, oftentimes brings demand. And if you wanted to just nail on it, build off the supply point, it's also diversity of supply. So if you go to a Northern Virginia, you have every flavor of data center product that you want. You want raw land, you get raw land, powered land, powered shell, cold shell turnkey, retail, hybrid, you know, it's the um, full spectrum. And I think it's going to be a natural evolution. If you look at how the data center industry grew, it's all around where the networks were, that's where you had the campuses. Um, 
Montreal has sort of always been the second child to Toronto because of the tour. That was where everybody was growing. Now with the new networks that are here and the power, I think it's naturally going to happen. Amazon is just a natural magnet for new network and it's just going to grow. I think the island is saturated, so there's going to be more growth on the periphery, but it's, it's just going to happen. And as, as a data center operator, we need help. We need help because buying lands, good lands, it's quite sometimes tough. You need to deal with the city for the permits. Uh, I don't want to share how many months it took us to get our permits in Saint Laurent, but that was pain in the neck. So if we want to grow that business, we need help. We need to concentrate ourselves on the business, building our data centers, bringing customers in, rather than fighting with the local authorities. Uh, and uh, I would like also Hydro Quebec put more proactivity in their network. Uh, we were looking lands in some places that there's no power for the next two or four years. So yeah. we cannot wait three years before we get this power in. So I think it's a society effort. Um, 1,000 megawatt might be big, but maybe 250 it's achievable in my mind. Well, you know, I think he brings up a great point, which is if you look at the other markets that have grown the way that they have in the last three to five years, it is not just you know, data center operators leading the way. It is communities that recognize the value of having these assets there. And when that pathway is cleared, um, you know, watch out because the growth can be really large. So um, we have reached our time. So I want to say uh, thank you to you all for listening. Thank you. Let's give our panelists a, a big round of applause one more time. And I would, just, I would just encourage you, I know they'll be around most of the day, so take some time uh, to ask questions. I know we didn't get to questions here, but if you had questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day. We appreciate it.